Um, the next talk is my friend Amelie, and she's going to be talking about firemen versus safety matches, how the current skills pipeline is all wrong. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So this is actually an interesting challenge for me. I've been coming here for quite a while, but uh, I'm here actually in my official duty. I'm a federal employee, but happen to actually uh, still have a job right now. I'm not on furlough, so um, I'm giving this in my official capacity. Uh, it's my first time actually giving an official talk, so this should be kind of interesting. Uh, so for the intro, um, if you didn't know, my name is Amelie Karan. I'm the deputy CIO for um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Inspector General's Office. Uh, my current role was more of a chief of staff role. Now it's actually, um, I'm actually the direct, acting director of digital services, so talking about modernization, cloud technologies and whatnot. So Bruce's uh, kind of rant earlier yesterday really kind of hit home, so now I'm kind of shaking because now it's like, oh, this is my problem now. So my introduction here is I've been to 13 of the 15 schmooze. I missed the first one and I missed 2015, so I'm kind of old. Um, happy F5 day has been interesting. I used to try to do the battle, but I have lots of great friends here who are actually in the audience who have managed to help out with uh, me getting tickets. And now this year I finally don't have to fight for tickets, so it's kind of cool. Uh, I've been doing this for a little over 20 years in various different roles, uh, kind of a breadth and depth. I've done kind of everything you've kind of wanted to do in the information security arena, policy, forensics, uh, malware analyst, incident response. So I'm kind of speaking at it more from done it, not necessarily an expert. Um, I came as an executive now through doing what most of folks get started doing, which is administration, engineering, architecture, analysts. That was part of my plan. A lot of people I went to school with, they immediately left school and became a consultant. I wanted to kind of learn the ground truth, figure out like how all this stuff works and how it goes together. Risk taker, heartbreaker. <laughs> Been through two marriages, so some of it's been uh, because of working too hard, but, um, but now I know, I feel like I know enough to be dangerous. I've um, previously actually did a rotation in the White House, so I've been uh, actually involved in uh, reviewing legislation. I helped start the U.S. Digital Service, which I finally got my t-shirt after so many years. Um, and uh, the things I really like doing to chill me out are <laughs> building Legos. And typically, you would have caught me motorcycling here, but with the thrill of snow, I didn't do that today, so. Um, so the carte du jour, the, the choices of the day here, um, are thrown to you as problems. Um, we have the accountant problem, the SEAL problem, the astronaut problem, the fireman slash doctor problem, and the matchmaker problem. And how they're presented are some of the situations where we encounter from day to day that we're attempting to address where we find ourselves with a darth of available people to fill all the spots that we supposedly have in our career space. And not just the career space in the, the manner of the fact that you are just cybersecurity, you're also talking supporting the agriculture industry, high tech, academia, uh, banking and financial. Um, so there's a lot more that we consider ourselves at just the cybersecurity and uh, information security career path, but also supporting all these other sectors that we find ourselves giving us a paycheck each and every day. So currently we have this, uh, the, the state of the art right now, the sit rep. So with most vocations are born out of need. A lot of times we've come to this, uh, some of us older, uh, that began as a hobby, a curiosity, and now it's actually become a vocation. Um, and uh, looking, kind of bringing the typical government thing in here, I'm going to bring in some statistics. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics Occupational Outlook Handbook. It's actually a really cool website. I don't think they publish it anymore now. But they give you a breakdown of what each career uh, space has. So if you're a farmer, they have statistics of how many farmers are in the United States and expected how often they're going to kind of grow over time. They've done this for uh, pretty much any kind of career that they run statistics for. The one for our career path is actually information security analyst. Um, that unfortunately is the big massive umbrella that covers every specialty. So their number says we, we number at 100,000. I don't believe that number. I think their statistics are off, but you know, this is what they've generated for their kind of basket of goods. And they expect it to kind of grow about 56% over the next six, uh, 10 years. So from uh, 2016 to 2026. That's an incredibly fast and large rate when you look at other 
uh, potential uh, career paths. So I mentioned, you know, the title of the talk is uh, Firemen versus Safety Matches. Firemen are actually, and, and uh, emergency response professionals are actually at a much lower rate, but that's still considered high. So we're in a super, super high growth industry. Um, so this all started um, where we are treading water horribly right now. We, we are actually, am I run the right number here? Yeah, right side. So, um, you know, you, you hear people, it's like, we, we've got an issue where uh, you know, there's too many open positions and not enough people to fill them. Yeah, to a point, as I think uh, Kristen Renner had last night talking about she's got open positions. We've got um, um, Nicole Schwartz last night also talking about, like, the, you know, there's they're actually not a shortage as well. It's just trying to match the people up. CyberSeq actually has a supply and demand heat map. Um, they update it mm, semi-regularly. But the numbers that we actually saw there were about 716,000 in the United States total employed cybersecurity workforce. So that's more along the lines of you have, you have a forensic specialist, reverse engineer, whatnot. But 314,000 are actually the open cybersecurity openings. That's, you know, a vacancy rate of about 30%. And my laptop is sliding, sorry, here. Um, but if you look at the total U.S. population, we're talking, you know, 325.7 million people in the United States. This makes up 0.3% of the entire population. That's tiny, 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 tiny bit. Um, but if you actually look at what the U.S. Department of Education says that we actually graduate per year, you know, you send a kid off to college, they go through the four or five years that they're there and potentially go into graduate school. We graduate about four million people per year who are going into the workforce. If we were actually to satisfy those openings in one year, the 300,000 in one year, we would actually need 8% of those, that graduating class immediately going into those jobs. So you see 0.3%, 8% of that, you're just not going to kind of keep up with that rate. Um, the other issue, too, is actually making it attractive. I think um, the folks from Penn College were you know, talking about their, their kids that were there. It was seven, uh, five out of 17 actually decided to kind of continue along with the uh, technology career, not necessarily in, in any of the cybersecurity stuff, but just within the technology career. So it's trying to get people to kind of stick around and actually go and, and actually do that work. So a friend of mine, um, Wendy Nather, I love that picture of her because uh, she did that for her uh, um, Skype calls. But uh, her and Andy Ellis, who's the CISO for Akamai, uh, uh, wrote a paper a bunch of years ago called the Security Poverty Line. And I actually found that's a, a really interesting kind of concept because if any of you are actually you know, working for an employer that has a reasonable amount of budget to deal with technology, there's always an argument about how much money you're actually going to go and s spend towards uh, security. And it's, it's always, that's a whole other talk of basically trying to rationalize you know, how much money you're going to go and spend for um, uh, HR, how much you're going to spend for software, hardware, and so forth to support the uh, security uh, apparatus that you have in place. And the issue is now, talking about scarcity, is, is that the demand line is not a straight line, it's not flat. It's more asymptotical. As more and more people uh, start to realize that their industry, agriculture, banking, and so forth, actually need cybersecurity professionals, that the demand curve is just going to just go through the roof, and there's actually no way to kind of get there, and you're starting to price people out. So, you know, as you start to, you know, you traverse from job to job, you're noticing that your, your salary bumps are getting a little bit more and more, but a lot more of those organizations aren't going to be able to afford you. So that starts to kind of inch up that security poverty line because even the larger companies can't afford the talent that they need to actually operate their systems. So for that, you're having to make very, very, very tough decisions of, well, do I'm going to go and buy the next blinky box that the vendor A comes by and tries to sell it to me? Or I'm going to try to buy a cheap software solution that says they can go and detect things instead of investing in talent. And that talent still needs to end up running those systems. So with that, you start to think about, well, what am I actually going to begin to start to strategize with the execution of my budget? 
And for my organization here with, with the federal government, you know, that can, tends to shrink and shrink each year. And now for some organizations, they have no money because Congress can't figure out how to get their heads out of their ass. <laughs> so, um, so we begin to start thinking, like, how do we start fixing this demand line? And a lot of us here, you know, we, we t attack this from the engineering problems. Like, we can kind of fix it through either engineering a better solution into it. We can throw more uh, tech at the problem. And one of those issues, too, now is as part of what I'm finding out starting to, leave a, uh, to lead a um, development operation is the concept of uh, the DevSecOps. And I know that gets talked around. It's one of those, those cases where it's like a cool new buzzword and folks are trying to figure out how to do it. But the key concept with that one is, is you're starting to build stuff in at the beginning. It's starting with security at, gosh, this thing does not want to stay up here. You're starting to actually inject security at the beginning of a development process. And there, instead of being the organization that says no, or is the holder of the last ditch thing that you need to do before deploying to production, you're actually involving yourself at the beginning. You're affecting the design. You're affecting the timelines of how things are actually going to be assessed. You also can affect what technologies are being chosen so that some developer or some project manager isn't going to go and include a library or start to pick a COTS product that necessarily is not secure because they've just decided, this is what I want, but it's, it doesn't uh, actually adhere to any of the security standards that the organization has picked up. Another issue that we have, too, is management's concept of, hey, there's a problem. If we got some people, let's throw it at it. And you get that mythical man month. I don't know if anybody has done um, some of the management training and whatnot, as you just like keep applying more and more people to kind of solve the problem. And what you end up finding is those folks who are really good or the folks who are actually leading that, that group are spending more time training those people that are coming on board. And if any of you are actually in a managerial role, you're like trying to tell your boss, please don't add more complexity to this situation because it's not going to get done faster. So it ends up creating more problems than it actually sets out to solve. So this one sometimes adheres a little bit to my own career is like kind of faking it till I make it. I've kind of like not necessarily failed up, but it's more or less being able to kind of uh, translate the engineering aspect of having worked uh, as the, the uh, uh, system architect or the system engineer and then working the way up to where I was actually directing engineers and um, administrators and starting to talk to executives saying, hey, let these folks do their work. I'll have them start to you know, tell me what they're doing, what they're working on, their problems, and my job here is to actually remove these types of roadblocks. But one of the cases we have right now is talking about the security poverty line is that folks will splurge on things that will make them look like they're actually succeeding. And one of those cases is, is where you're, you, know, you see somebody who looks like they could be just living from paycheck to paycheck, but they're driving around in a hot new Mercedes or you know, living in a very expensive apartment that just doesn't seem to jive with their job. And we do that ourselves here where, you know, hey, I've got the Mandiant or FireEye box in my network. I feel safe. And I've spent $200,000 or $300,000 plus maintenance on this thing. But it makes me feel secure. It makes me feel good that I've done something for my organization. And it really doesn't kind of actually act up being a practical solution because you've added this there. You don't have anybody potentially to tune it because, you know, that talent has been priced out. Finding a specialist, if you pick some type of widget that ends up happening to be, you know, there's only about 10 of those people in your local area that can administer it, so you're, you're either trying to find a consultant at a higher rate, you're trying to hire them away from another person, so that means you've got to apply more money towards it. And it just gets into this vicious cycle. The other issue, too, is you get analysis through paralysis, analysis paralysis, sorry, it's one of those little tongue twisters, where folks are not willing to act because they don't know what's going to be next. They're worried about if they make this decision, they're going to be out of a job because that decision will kind of cascade into another issue where uh, it'll require more technology, it'll require more people, it'll require more expenditure of budget. So they won't do anything. And that's sometimes off, often the worst, is that you just basically just leave it as is. And you, know, you, you have to end up trying to pick your battles. You've got to figure out like what's going to be good, what's going to be bad, who should I actually uh, put in this role to kind of lead this, or do I just ignore it? 
So the thing that actually started me thinking about this topic was I was sitting at a round table with a bunch of my senior leadership peers in government. And they said, well, you know, this whole cybersecurity uh, pipeline thing is actually just going to be a fad. Like, you know, I can go and, you know, wait this thing out. We'll just wait until the demand's down and we'll go and try to hire whoever's left over. And this is actually coming from federal uh, IT leadership. You know, your CIOs and CISOs around the federal government. I'm just like, really, like, you, you can't wait this out. It's, it's like you're going to be battling with the mom and pop shop in the corner store who also realize that they need some people to secure their point of sale systems and to secure the connection to the um, credit card system that they've now tied to, which now requires PCI compliance. And it just gets in this vicious cycle. You're just not going to kind of wait this thing out. So with that, I go, hey, you know, there's got to be a better way about how to basically deal with this. You know, for most folks, they'll take a look at the, the breaches that have occurred over the last couple of years, specifically um, Equifax. And they'll look at that and say, well, that's an edge case. That'll never happen to me. And eventually, it, what goes around comes around. I, I recently was talking to um, a, a large um, uh, support organization for higher ed. And they, they asked me the question, so, so what do you see for us to actually have to go and start telling universities to kind of go and do? Like train students, train, uh, talk to administrators about what their biggest threats are. And I said, well, you know, if you look at all these data breaches over time, you know, they've progressed from simple information gathering to they started attacking banks and getting uh, credit card information, and those have been resold. And then they realized they wanted more personal information to make that more useful. So you start seeing stuff like from healthcare. And those, those circles of areas that started getting breached, you know, it's actually followed a pattern. And I'm like thinking, well, most of this is all economic based. It's, you know, if you want to use the, the, the killer threat here of the APT, um, you know, it's usually nation states, and they, they're using this for an economic advantage. And where's the next frontier? It's all that research. It's all that, that um, uh, knowledge that they've developed doing products, innovative uh, uh, stuff for uh, under government contracts. And so that's where you're going to basically need, need to start thinking about where you're going to be dealing with talent. And, you know, if you follow these trends, you can, you can start to think like, all right, we actually need to kind of start thinking strategically about this. And, you know, unfortunately, it also gets into a case is folks start to highly specialize in those areas. You know, it's like, I want to be a, uh, you know, a data security specialist. I'm like, well, there's no training courses for that. There's no, you know, more formalized education. So, so what are you going to do? Do you, do you go into specialty or are you going to generalize? So one of those cases is, is that do you need to satisfy the need to gratify? And with that is, do you need to, to just make somebody happy with your, with your um, the decision that they're making, or are you actually making a decision that's actually going to be strategic over time? And if you get into this cycle here, it's essentially, you know, you're going to be cycling through bad decision after bad decision after bad decision, and eventually you're going to have to uh, deal with all this tech debt, the security tech debt that you have. You're going to have shelfware. Government's very, very well known for that. So, the first problem we have is the accountant problem. As I mentioned before, that um, a lot of times you look at this thing and it's like, I can always find an accountant. I can go down the, the, the uh, accountancy hiring location and find somebody who's going to go and basically be uh, you know, someone who can run my books. And that's a great strategy if that's all you're thinking about. With a security person, like stuff changes from day to day. Accountancy, you have some regulations you may have to deal with, but security, it's a minute by minute change. And how do you, you know, it's easy to get an account, you're not having to worry so much about keeping up on training. Security people, you come to conferences like this, you're basically having to reach out for knowledge, tapping your friends, going on, on Twitter, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, you know, basically trying to, trying to fight your way to keep, keep yourself relevant. And, you know, you, you talk, as I mentioned, talking to the IT uh, leadership there in the federal government, it's like, we can always find one. We can always find an accountant. We can always find an IT security person. You know, it's the concept of the one and done. You know, the skills freshness doesn't matter. And the age training, I, you know, just kind of happens because no one invests. It's always the first thing that gets killed when you talk, start talking about a budget. Well, that comes with its own hidden costs. For me, my personal thing with that was that I worked for the uh, World Bank for a time. And as a contractor, you know, they, they were willing to give me training. So I went up to Usenic, uh, Usenic's uh, security uh, um, conference a couple years ago. 
And they came back, and I tried to get reimbursed, and they said, well, we expected you to come here with all the knowledge you would ever need. We were never sending you to training. And I'm like, well, that's kind of not going to happen because like the people who I'm fixing your problem with, this is multiple months after I've tried to get the reimbursement, like all these folks that just caused this major breach here, like they're learning new stuff every day and you're expecting me to just kind of use the stuff I used six months ago to battle them. That vulnerability that just came out, I wouldn't have known about it if I wouldn't have spent the time to keep up on that. So you're paying me to keep up on that and you should also send me to training to know more about this on a day-to-day -day basis, start to networking with people like we do here. So. It's a, it's a battle of perception at that point. We have special domain challenges. A lot of times it's stuff that no one understands. I think someone was talking about earlier that um, actually the previous talk was uh, you know, folks are kind of spooked by technology. It's not one of those things like, you know, why, why does my uh, refrigerator connect to the internet? You know, you can't logic that with your grandparents. You can barely logic it, logic it with your spouse if they're not into technology. Um, and security people also tend to think that their choice of occupation involves a lot of specialized skills, which it does. It also involves a lot of creativity. And that is, you guys don't have a, a, a monopoly on that. Um, there's a lot of creative people out there that could actually help you make your lives a lot easier. And, uh, you know, when you come to a con like this and you say, hey, I went to secure, I went to a hacker con. That sounds a lot better than going and I went to a financial services conference. Um, it's sexy, it really is. So, you know, where do you get the attention? Well, hey, you go and tell somebody, would you like to be on the front page of the Washington Post where you have a major, major data breach? Like, invest in us, invest in the time. You're going to need to invest to keep yourself out of uh, harm's way with, when it comes to reputational issues. But, again, you know, unless you have a major incident like the Equifax or um, I think Blue Cross Blue Shield a couple years ago, you're not going to get any traction. But you have to use that kind of zeitgeist at that point in, point in time to actually kind of keep things moving forward. I think, um, see we had the, the Equifax breach at the end of 2017. We just finally got the congressional report at the last couple of months of 2018, a year. But in that year, we were always kind of wondering, like, what were we doing about it? And of course, the report landed and security professionals were like, hey, this is some really good stuff, lessons learned. But other than that, there's no retribution. So, you know, how do we kind of keep that mindset in there that, like, hey, this is a thing that we need to continue on? It's only after they get poked with a stick or they have their own major breach do you actually get something forward. So, you know, the thing here is that we still consider this kind of a, a hacker security conference. And, you know, it's, it's one of those cases that's become more and more professionalized. One of the things I have a challenge is all my peers have advanced degrees, graduate degrees, postdoctorate degrees. I have more people that I sit around the table with that have doctor or PhD after their title than I have with a, a bachelor of science. So we're becoming more professionalized. We're, we're getting these cases where you, know, you can't get a job without a security certificate or going through a cybersecurity program or getting a degree. And it's a real sea change that we have in our own environment here is because now people are expecting that as of, of us. So if you are a little longer in the tooth of having been in this community, it's a little sometimes harder to sell, to sell yourself because you're up there and you're going, hey, I've been in here long enough, but I don't have this long list of credentials, so how do you stay relevant? Well, unfortunately, giving talks like this, but also you know, trying to say, hey, having me on staff, you've seen my value of trying to manage your strategy, working with you, telling you the truth, building that trust. And I also highlight here as Peter Gregory, if you've watched uh, Silicon Valley, he's the one that basically said you, you should not go to school. And, and one of those cases I also I'll tell a lot of people who are trying to get in the industry, you don't have to go to school. You can be curious. I, I, a lot of times I've ended up interviewing folks who I'm more excited about the fact that they had a home network and they played around on that than them actually going into a classroom and spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on a degree and have absolutely no practical experience of how to glue stuff together. Another challenge, too, is the reason people are, are, are brought into, say, accountancy, it's a safe, predictable career. You go in, you clock in, you clock out. Many of us here are probably nursing a hangover, probably nursing the massive lack of sleep. Um, that's going to cause you some burnout. But well, that's one of those cases is the reason we love it, because it 
keeps us curious, it keeps us learning, it keeps us moving on the, on the front end, but it's also unpredictable because we could be part of that next breach. We could be the CISO for Equifax and find ourselves out of a job the next day when the board decides, hey, you're no longer relevant. So I see this as a, uh, another problem is the seal problem. And can anybody recognize at least one of the people in this photo here? Okay. Uh, Simon Smith, the investigator. I don't know if anybody knows that at all. He's a, he had, had a little run-in with the security community a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago. Um, I qualify this as the, the overrepresentation issue or the stolen valor, where you have people coming in, seeing that we have a high demand and shortage and selling themselves at more than what they actually are. And unfortunately, that's one of those cases where we get the titles of rock stars and ninjas, the folks who can kind of drop themselves in, say great things, assure the board that nothing's going to happen, and basically walk away scot-free until that something bad happens. You realize, didn't we just pay that person a lot of money to go and actually solve that? They didn't do squat. So you start to lose trust. So you get another good, you know, you get another person that says they have all the same credentials, and, and it's that once bitten, twice shy. They may not want to actually hire you or employ you or actually use your services because you came in with the same credentials, the same background as the other person that was a charlatan or one of these stolen valor individuals. So it dilutes the actual pool of people who want to get into it because you know, it just makes it distasteful to call yourself a certain type of investigator. You have that certificate that, like EC Council for not renewing their SSL certificate. So like, hey, I don't want an ethical hacker certificate because these guys can't even secure their own website. But it ends up lowering the trust among your organization and among your peers. And it makes it harder to find the right talent, as I mentioned before. So I also call this the death of the rock star. There's a really good tweet by um, uh, Chad Loader back in uh, December. And if I can actually read this one up here. So InfoSec doesn't need rock stars, ninjas, or geniuses. We need lots of nine to five professionals. How many of you actually keep regular hours? Probably. Wow, I want your job. Uh, he's a federal employee, I don't get to do the nine to five. But think public health, and this is why I get to kind of come at it, because I'm in the public health sector, not war. You can run your healthcare system with everyone running around thinking he's Dr. House MD, and if you've seen that show, you got an egotistical, hot-headed maniac basically running the show, calling the shots. But if we keep using the war as a metaphor for cybersecurity, we'll have the same results that we had on the war on drugs, the war on poverty, and the war on crime. Those all gone away, right? No, it's never going to go away. So what we don't need armies, we need communities. All of us here, all of us who go to hacker cons, go to meetups, and so forth, those are the types of people we need. And we need new ways of building. So this is like, all right, so there's a pool of people here. What are we going to do next? I do disagree with the, the House MD comment because he was actually a diagnostician, which is somebody who actually sits down and tries to figure out, like, who needs to be brought in on a case. So his, his metaphor was a little broken on that. But other than that, he was pretty spot on with it. Um, he actually had another good quote there. So to continue with the public health metaphor, we have a generation of InfoSec professionals who only want to work on Ebola. Yet they decide, deride those who want to work on heart disease, smoking cessation, and access to clean water. Have any other people that are sound egotistical in that range? We need people who are working on all the stuff. We need people who are working on the arcane and deep, deeply technical stuff, too. There is stuff that people are working down the hall that I don't have the brain for. I mean, I, I originally went in for electrical computer engineering, and I came out with a social sciences degree. But I still understand how processors work. I, I can do microcode. Like, I love microcode. But stop dismissing folks who are in governance, audit, compliance as not real security. There's, there's plenty of good reasons, and I will bring this up in the next slide here, about why that's worthwhile. So the compliance argument will come in a minute, but we have the astronaut problem too, which is a little bit like the rock star problem. Everybody, when they're growing up, probably at one point in time wanted to be an astronaut. Like, I want to fly to the stars, I want to land on the moon, I'm going to do a whole bouncy thing. It'd be great not going to happen. There's a small amount of people that can consider themselves part of the astronaut corps. But the cool thing about the astronaut corps is it's not just people who are like astrophysicists or pilots. It's folks who deal with uh, physiology and, and biologists and, and uh, geologists. There's, there's this whole cool crew that actually makes up what people get selected for the astronaut corps. I'm like, hey, that's really neat. It's a team building kind of situation. 
and very STEM focused, so you can kind of see the parallels between like cybersecurity and, and, and their idea of like putting a lot of people through STEM programs and, and the astronaut issue. But you know, one of those cases too is that astronauts' lives as a career are very short lived. Like it's it's a you know kind of a, um, you know literally a moonshot. Like you're, you're hoping that you're going to get in the astronaut corps, but you're also hoping you're going to be on a mission. There's plenty of astronauts that have never seen space time. They're, you know, it's, it's the fact is, is like they can call themselves an astronaut, but usually the other question among astronauts are like, did you fly? And sometimes they haven't. It's been a case where someone on their, their mission crew got sick and you just missed your spot. So you're kind of trying to catch a lightning in the bottle at that point in time. And that's one of those cases with sp specializing within inf information security arenas. If I'm going to be really good at this piece of uh, analysis, you kind of run through with blinders because, you know, if something changes, say like with spaceflight, Virgin Galactic, you know, they're going to shortcut that entire thing. So being sexy astronaut is not going to matter much because everybody's just been democratized into space travel because you have somebody that's kind of gone and made it like driving across town. So you need to kind of pick your, your battles, like what's your, what's your lifespan going to be? And the case here with um, trying to focus on, you know, I'm going to develop people who are only in cybersecurity, you potentially have that issue down the road because you know, we're going to get assisted uh, uh, help with automation through artificial intelligence, machine learning, lots of other techniques that are coming out there that kind of get us into more of an analyst role of trying to do what humans do well, which is actually use our brain to do decision making and problem solving rather than just kind of chew through data. However, as I mentioned, there's always this alternative. This story just came out <laughs> earlier this, uh, this week which was the uh, Henna, Hen, Henna Strange Hotel in Japan. Uh, they made the news, I think, last year or so, where they had a velociraptor working the front desk as a robot. Um, one of those cases was is now that the robots that are actually in the hotel have become so onerous to maintain that they're removing the robots because they've now required more people to do the job that the robots were trying to actually replace. Um, so the, the, the crux of the one story was the, one of the groups of layoffs included a doll-shaped assistant, which is the one that's in the photo here, that is called Churi. Siri and Google and Assistant and Alexa can answer questions about the local businesses opening and closing times, but Churi couldn't. So it failed at its basic task. And one of those cases here is like you become so specialized for that and you're using this, your, your technology here and you end up failing. You're failing miserably because you've hyper-focused on doing this, this great thing to do automation and it ends up just basically failing because you haven't actually addressed the overall problem of, of say, customer satisfaction or guest services and, and whatnot. So here we get to the crux is the fireman problem. So this is where the rubber hits the road. And uh, yeah, I, I'll make the parallel here is us as cyber security professionals are much like firemen. It's a band of brothers brothers and sisters, we use the St. Crispin's Day, Henry V um, Shakespeare analogy here. And we also just run into the breach. Firemen and fire, fire women will go into a burning building, but not everybody's going to want to do that. I sure as hell wouldn't. I think it's cool. I'm glad that they're there. I'm glad, you know, I can pull a fire alarm or call for help or dial 911 and they'll show up. But damned if I want to do that. And you've got a lot of coworkers who aren't in our career are so glad that you're there to go do incident response or run the malware tools or you know, teach them about the stuff that they just don't have the time to do. So the other thing too is I think there's a lot of other uh, talks on this before, but Amanda Berlin's also doing one on, on uh, InfoSec burnout. Same situation with the, the uh, fire services is that you know, after a while you just can't deal with it anymore. Um, actually got to verify some of this data. We had a, um, our car uh, got a flat a couple days ago and rode back with a person who's a tow truck driver who, who is a former first responder uh, for 9-11. And he hung on as long as he could after that. Like, he saw stuff that he never, ever wants to see again. In fact, you could talk to any EMT and they will regale you in stories upon stories about stuff that just is disgusting. Like, heads that have rolled off or people who have bled out or some weird wacky thing. Someone decided to, to you know, connect a, uh, a segue to the back of a jet ski or some weird shit like that and ended up dying or losing an arm or whatever. And that gets to you over time. And, you know, as I mentioned, I've done a, a broad um, uh, kind of tour of duty. 
where uh, you know I've had to work child porn cases, and I'm like, I don't want to do forensics anymore, so I'm going to kind of pivot into policy here. And I was like, well, policy is boring. Let me go back to incident response. So it's you're, you're kind of pivoting there and trying to find your way. But after a while, you just give up, and you have a lot of people end up quitting information security. And that's the same thing with first responders. But we also, firemen and police and first responders also treat themselves as family. And that's the thing I think what's great about here is we got each other's back. I had a conversation with someone this morning, and we talked about life in a certain situation. And that was the cool thing. It was like it wasn't security, but we built that trust up. And that's the same thing with the, the fireman analogy is that, you know, the thin blue line, which sometimes can get critiqued however you want to, but they're there to kind of support. But we also have our fair share of creepy uncles and missing stairs, but I'm not going to touch that one with a 10-foot pole. Um, you know, we've had conferences that are shortly ending because of situations like that, but um, that's time for, for another talk after that. And of course, there's internal family disagreements. Uh, you know, one of the cases here, you know, with the whole reason that we have the Sh mountains, please don't toss any, I've got glasses on, um, is you can call bullshit on people. And you can do it in such a way that it's actually not going to cause them to not like you anymore. You're just expressing disagreement and opinion. And I think that's what's great about here is there's always a different way to kind of look at things. So here's a little bit of audience participation. How many people out of 100 are emergency responders? Point eight percent. So I mentioned earlier, 0.3% of us make up that. We are kind of in that class, but there are actually more firemen and EMTs and police out there kind of protecting people than we are. But we're kind of in the same percentage, so there's a lot of weight on us to basically do a lot more. We need to mul uh, basically be a f multiplier. And then you have the questions, how many people remain this career longer than 5, 10, or 15 years? Well, with a, a lot of the firemen and, and firefighters, they actually, this is a career for them, it's uh, 30 years. But I know with the amount of stress that we've been going through and the, the demands, a lot of us are leaving a lot earlier, and that's a challenge as well. And does the general public consider firemen high skill occupation? Yeah, they should, because they've got to go to school. They've got to practice their, their, their work. They, you know, do the, if you walk by some uh, fire training facilities, they regularly have to go in there and uh, recertify and learn all the, the hose work and all the other stuff there. But EMT's got to go in for regular training and get recertified. So, you know, they, it mirrors us pretty well. And, uh, you know, say, what happens when the number of emergency responders decreases in a high utilization area? You saw that after major, uh, major incidents such as 9-11 where you had a lot of those uh, first responders just get burned out very quickly. And how are you going to get those people back in the force? Well, you start recruiting from somewhere else and you start pulling resources away from other areas. So you have this uh, uh, contraction of talent in certain areas and then that makes them more vulnerable. And the similar situation here is if we're all going to swarm on a problem, we get potentially are actually leaving a lot more other things vulnerable. But what's the pipeline for emergency responders? That I can't answer. There, you know, you, sometimes people want to go and become uh, a master's in art and then suddenly decide, well, I also want to be a fireman or a volunteer fireman. And it gives you that opportunity, but there's no way to kind of determine who wants to be a fireman. It's just a choice you end up making at that point with your career. So here we go with the fireman. Is you don't necessarily expect a fireman to actually like build a building um, and uh, you know, basically put sprinklers in and select the right kind of drywall. So that's where you start reaching out and finding people who are in other fields that actually start to reduce your workload. So, you know, with that, you're talking about materials engineering, help, helping to build fire retardants into drywall and, and some of the other building materials, such as the wood, and then framing around that. And sprinklers and, and, and new construction are actually one of those things that has actually become as a regulation, but a fireman didn't design it. It was just a good idea to have a sprinkler in. And with one of those cases there is it actually has made their lives easier because it's less things that they actually have to go and do. Like um, if a sprinkler system is activated, it comes down, it potentially put out the fire. You don't necessarily need as many people actually kind of um, a fireman to actually show up for that. So it's kind of a, a multiplier in the respect that it reduces the potential harm when, when something bad actually happens. Also, there's a change in way of doing things. Like, before microwaves were invented, you had tons of grease fires. You know, you, most people would have a gas stove and stuff would catch on fire and, and whatnot. But we've gotten the microwave. And most people will go for the convenience of a microwave and stick something in, and there's less fire to actually deal with there. And uh, now that, uh, that that's occurred, you, you maybe have the occasional popcorn bag that'll go smoking. But uh, 
uh, you don't have as many deaths from cooking fires. In some cases, too, in industrial kitchens, you'll have sprinkler systems and the like. Uh, another issue is the design and operating environment. For firemen here, we uh, would see them consulting on uh, potentially making kitchens more, more safe by you know, encasing it in stainless steel. Same thing we would do here is you, you build a more secure operating environment by having standards and guidelines. And in another case as well is the upskilling and training. That's one of the things that we have actually as a, as a benefit for us instead of having to deal with trying to hire more and more people into the field is that you can actually look at other IT individuals in your organization and actually work to train them up to be more of a generalist to kind of allow the specialist to focus on the specialty factor and the generalist to actually do their, uh, um, the, the bulk of the, the kind of the Pareto distribution, the 80% of the work that just can be done by most general uh, technical people. So we can do the harm reduction through skills diversity. For us in the technical field, we have software engineers, not security people. They can do a lot of the secure coding that we do, systems engineering and systems thinking. I, you know, I came up through as a systems engineer. I wasn't necessarily a security professional, but by coming up as a systems engineer, you can actually end up securing your uh, environment by understanding all the regulations you have to build a system by, so NIST standards and so forth. Uh, UI UX, as Bruce kind of ranted uh, earlier yesterday, you know, the, the frustrations with uh, uh, Windows Update and I think Matt later on about how cryptogra cryptography systems are awful because they're not user friendly. Get a UI UX person in there. Get them to think about how humans actually have to interact with that. That things makes more, uh, things more secure because you're, making, you're allowing the user to make less mistakes. Testing QA and QC. How many people have run, rushed something into production without uh, actually testing it? Admittedly, come on, come on. You, you have a pressure, you gotta kinda go and push something out, you've done it without testing. But building that into the process, the whole idea of DevSecOps is actually uh, the point where you actually have that QA and QC automated, but nevertheless you have that as part of the process. And the other thing is too, is talking about training, training into being the only. So that's going and deciding not to just be a specialist, I'm just going to be really good in this area. I'm going to train into the field and get, get your feet wet. Do some policy stuff. Do some forensics. Do instant response. Make yourself useful. Get the mindset. And again, you don't always need a specialist when a generalist will do. Um, a lot of times, you know, your primary care physician is most likely an internist. And that's not like they just work here or they only work on interns. They, they are folks who generally understand, uh, you know, kind of the entire body as a whole. But they know when something's bad, they're going to go call in a gastroenterologist or a neurologist or a podiatrist if you have a bad bunion. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's having enough people, that have, you're getting that general background, they know who to call in when they need, to, need the help. And the other issue is talking about the, the uh, career progression is everyone wants to be an Insta specialist. No one wants to kind of wait. So everyone wants to jump in and I want to become the immediate expert. And the challenge I have here is I get a lot of resumes that show up that have tons of certifications, but you ask them practical questions about what are you going to do if I gave you this scenario, they don't know how to do it. It's, it's like I've got this training, but I've never had a chance to apply it. And that's kind of you know, wanting to be the captain before they've learned how to be the deckhand. So I'm going to rush through a little bit of the last slides because I've, I've spent a little bit of time earlier. But again, it all gets down to workforce planning. You got to kind of think about the future. You got to think about your strategy on that. And you know, the pipeline of uh, specialty students will never, ever, ever, ever meet our needs. So if you have a manager who says, well, we're just going to keep hiring students or we're going to push people into STEM programs, it's just not going to work. You need to work with what you have. You need to do your, your situational assessment here and find out like, who can you get to help, even if it's non-traditional. We had a, a closing plenary a couple years ago here at ShmooCon where you know, folks were talking about getting design students to go through some basic uh, uh, technology literacy. You get humanity students to just learn how not to operate poorly in those environments, and that's your force multiplier as well. So you, know, you can address the pipeline by actually getting general education involved. Um, the other thing out of this too is to be able to check yourself. Know that you may think you're an expert, but you're really not an expert. You need to step out of your ego on this one. You need to basically stand back going and saying, I actually need help. For me, it's presentation skills, but for other things, it's also knowing that, hey, uh, I need to look at this from a different perspective. I need to look at it from the user's perspective, my manager's perspective, my grandmother's perspective, and realize that, oh, yeah, what I'm doing doesn't actually going to actually make their lives any better. So to kind of step out of your own shoes and your own 
own thinking and going, okay, I can potentially do this a little bit better by looking it through someone else's eyes. So, i skip through here, actually. So, looking at the construction paradigm, the things we've done that actually made our lives a little bit better is that we have building codes and zoning stuff from model codes. These are things that are adopted through attrition, essentially. Um, they design them, they involve people to work on the model codes. Here for us, particularly in the security arena, it's stuff that has been garnered from the, the NIST standards, the 800 series. And most people, unfortunately, use that as the, the, the uh, mandate. Thou shall only do 853. No, it's, there, it's guidance. Uh, having flipped from federal agency into the private sector and back again, going to the private sector is like, yeah, well, we use this to kind of be the best rule of thumb. They're good guidelines, they're best practices, but, you know, we have other regulations we need to adhere to. But we'll use them as, as basically building standards. And the same thing goes for building codes. It's like, it doesn't, you know, if the architect had to adhere strictly to only building by the, the ISO standards, you have really ugly houses. Or you have stuff that, if you have the whole free fall, you have Frank Lloyd Wright stuff. If you've gone to Falling Water, if you've gone there and you've seen kind of where the, the, the floor is actually broken because the guy didn't understand engineering. Um, again, too, building materials. You know, know what you're actually going to be building your environment and your, uh, your organization on. Understand the tools. Don't, just don't buy them because someone says you need to have this type of protection. You know, the, the meltdown. You know, cases like meltdown where it was this fear tactic of having a named vulnerability out there. It didn't matter to a hill of beans because there wasn't going to be a tool out there or a solution out there that was easily going to solve it. It was as a 10-year-old, 15-year-old bug. And you, it's like what's old is new again. So you had a lot of unscrupulous vendors that were coming by and it's like, hey, you buy our product or you hire our consultants, we can fix this for you. And that's the problem is, is like a lot of those, those cases were that people are like, okay, well, I need to fix this. I'm, they're driven by fear. And that, that doesn't actually help anybody at all. And that goes back to talking about architecture and design. Like if you can actually build it, document it, make sure that you're doing best the rule of thumb, you're going to be fine. So just pace yourself, realize it's not going to be that bad. And again, talking about reviews and compliance. The whole concept of this, and you look at this in building codes, is that you know, when you're building a building, you have an emergency exit there for a reason. You have your fire extinguisher there for a reason. They go through regular certification to make sure they still work when you need it. That's the rule for compliances and regulations, is to make sure the stuff that you have there is still going to work when you need it. You may hate the paperwork, but at least you're testing it. And that's the key thing to get out of those, that compliance factors, is that you're actually testing what you've built. So never, ever look down at a, at a consultant that comes in that's just a compliance checker. Because it may be just like checkbox security, but it's checking to make sure it's there. And that's a good value, because I, I ran by that thing as security is not compliance, but it's, it's not something that could actually drive security. It's a check for you doing security. So I'm going to finish here with a, a really cool tweet with <laughs> Jake Williams. So he, he got proposed this, this question about uh, you know, what fire extinguisher would you use on a fire of your server room? And uh, he's like, oh, I don't know, but I spent a lot of cycles trying to memorize close to the, for the SysP what that actually had to be. I guessed it was C, the answer is C. But the key thing is talking about being able to check yourself is that he's no longer SysP, let it expire. He doesn't remember the answer to the question without probably Googling it because everyone kind of has that shift off after a while. And, uh, you know, he spent a lot of time memorizing that. So it's kind of the risk reward on spending the time learning it versus what it's actually going to pay off. I would rather have somebody whose sole idea is to maintain your data center to deal with that, not me as a professional. But I don't think of Jake any less for admitting, like, he doesn't know this stuff anymore. He's still highly regarded. And you can be the same de deal. Like, you're still high regarded, but, you know, you don't have to know what fire extinguisher is going to extinguish your, your, your fire uh, on your server. So, you know, again, realize stuff, some stuff as you progress are not going to be as useful in the long term. And finally, the matchmaker problem. This is the other key thing before we wrap up here, is that you need, you need leadership and management willing to kind of uh, look elsewhere, look, look deeper, look wide, look for creative ways to solve your problem. They're the ones that got control on the purse strings. And with that is that they will be your best advocate, but they also be your greatest enemy. I know a lot of you will probably deal with the case that, hey, I need $30,000 to solve this problem. Well, what am I going to do about it? You've got to reason with them saying, all right, well, I'll do this trade-off. I'll work with the networking team to go get this tool. We'll do it and we'll have it so we can get network statistics, but it also gives us flow, flow monitoring so we can actually look at behavioral analysis on the network. 
you team together, you actually make use of the money. And they see that and they see how you're doing the, that level of reasoning, they're more willing to, to uh, work with you for further requests. Um, awareness. Don't be afraid to tell your boss bad news. For me, the straighter I am with my management, the straighter I am with my peers, the more trust I build, the, chal the challenge is no longer there to kind of win them over to how I'm thinking because they know what's going on. They have the read of the land, and uh, that, that's the thing that actually is um, some, somewhere that you just can't basically hire out of a school or go to the, the latest search shop and pull the next person with a certification, and it's that, that trust and openness with your uh, folks there. And finally, the perfect is the enemy of the good enough. Don't always drive to have the perfect solution. There's never going to be a perfect solution. By the time you build it, much like the time you print something in a paper book, it's irrelevant because it's changed and things have moved on. Get yourself to a point where it's actually going to be useful and workable and maintainable and administratable. Because after a while, as long as you, it's a well-documented system and you have people you can trust to operate it, It'll actually make it easier to run in the long term. You'll be more secure, and you'll have a chance of actually keeping your job longer than the next breach. And uh, to wrap up, embrace the suck. Admit, we're going to work long hours. You can change your career. You can change your life. You can take a break. You can take a sabbatical. Enjoy the time away. So learn to step away. Go to bar con. Drink a little bit. Go out and have a fun at the party tonight. But you, know, you get a chance to blow off. Don't be afraid to, to, to blow off steam. If you're having a problem, talk to somebody about it. Don't leave this industry. We need you. <laughs> we really, really do. I've been very close to quitting many times and opening up a food truck. But I realize that I actually enjoy what I do. I enjoy the people I talk to. And uh, um, I enjoy with all of you people who've come to see me babble. <laughs> and uh, uh, thanks a lot for your time. I don't think I can take any questions, comments, or sh uh, schmountains, but uh, you're definitely available afterwards if you want to talk about the subject more. But um, uh, I hold this near and dear to my heart, and I hope you do too. So thank you.